Earlier this month, we discussed The Ring series, one of the formative properties in the J-horror movement of the later 1990s and early 2000s. We argued in those videos that the movement within Japan was more or less dead by the time that Gore Verbinski's take on The Ring hit American theaters in 2002. After this set of films had more or less run their course, however, films, which Americans might have called J-horror, continued to be produced. The difference with these later projects was that they are often noted as being somewhat cliché and derivative of earlier films. One such series was One Missed Call, the series which we'll be discussing this week, a pretty strange amalgam of circumstances which came to be after the death of the proper J-horror genre. The One Missed Call films, released in 2003, 2005, and 2006, were based upon a trio of novels by Yasushi Akimoto. For more information on this multi-talented man, who's done everything from founding pop groups to producing television series and penning novels, check out our video on Grauen no Torikago, where we delved further into Akimoto's background. The first film is noted for having premiered before the novel was released, meaning Akimoto may have actually adapted his work from the film. The second and third novels, meanwhile, were released prior to their respective films, with Akimoto getting a credit in each movie for his work. The screenplays for all three, on the other hand, were penned by Minako Daira. Daira wrote the first and second films alone, but had a co-writer on part three, but we'll get there later. Unfortunately, information seems extremely scarce on the internet regarding Daira. As far as we can tell, besides these three films and a based upon credit for the 2008 American version of One Missed Call, Daira only worked on one earlier TV drama, and disappeared once the series was concluded. The director of the first One Missed Call, on the other hand, is a bit better known and a bit more prolific than Daira. That's right, the first film was directed by our favorite madman, Takeshi Miike. Depending on whether you find the gospel in One Missed Call's festival debut in 2003 or its wide release in 2004, it became either one of six films or one of five films he put to screen in each respective year. We've covered Miyake a number of times up to now on Cinema Nippon, so feel free to check out any of those videos for more information on his work ethos, his backstory, or his diverse style. Unfortunately, One Missed Call was quickly and readily panned by a number of critics as being more sanitized and paint-by-numbers compared with what was expected of Miyake's signature wild style. We would argue that there are still glimmers of Miyake's madness throughout this somewhat mundane project, but we'll get there. Following its Japanese release, One Missed Call hit American shores courtesy Media Blasters in 2005. This was when the American remake train was beginning to derail, as well as right in the midst of all those Ring sequel DVD releases stateside. As such, the film made a minimal splash this side of the Pacific, until it was reissued in early 2020 by Arrow Video. Now that the whole trilogy of films is available easily and in high quality, let's explore the first film before examining the style and legacy of One Missed Call. It might be considered a lesser entry into the J-horror canon, but there's still a bit to be learned by looking deeper. One Missed Call begins with a high school girl, Yoko, receiving a voicemail from herself dated two days in the future. After a couple days of fear, the indiscernible audio in that voicemail comes to be as Yoko dies on the date and time of the call she received. Her boyfriend, Kenji, follows up in much the same fashion. We then arrive at Yumi, Yoko's friend and Kenji's by proxy, who seeks to investigate these deaths. Yumi, during her journey, runs into Detective Hiroshi Amashita, whose own sister was a victim of the same phenomenon. The film further spirals with another friend of Yumi dying, then Yumi getting the voicemail herself. As Yumi and Detective Yamashita find, it turns out this is all related to a young girl named Mimiko Mizunima, who died of an asthma attack thanks to a neglectful mother. Yumi, having been abused by her own mother, sees her own struggle in Mimiko's story, and feels sympathy for the child. As fate would have it, however, the 11th hour twist shows that Mimiko wasn't abused. She was actually abusing her younger sister, Nanako. Nanako is still alive, and helps us learn that she was always given candy by Mimiko so she wouldn't complain to their mother. Mimiko did have asthma attacks whenever she would hurt Nanako, which helped to distract from her abuse of her younger sister. Once their mother learned the truth, she rushed Nanako to the hospital, leaving Mimiko to die of an attack alone at home. The film ends with Yumi and Detective Yamashita implied to be taking on the roles of Mimiko and Nanako, the abuser and the abused. 
almost as though they have become possessed, or else they've simply fallen into the pre-existing roles established by the two young girls. From that description, you likely noted some similarities with other movies of this period. The infection which spreads through electronic equipment. The premonitions or warnings of one's own death. The idea of these abuses becoming cyclical, and so on. All of these are elements which can be found in earlier films which may be described as J-horror, particularly the grandmama of them all. What we mean to say here is that One Missed Call plays like an updated derivative of Ring. And if you only replace the videotape with a phone call and modify the time window where someone gets to keep living, you get the general idea of this series. In fact, upon the initial release of One Missed Call, some reviewers in the English-speaking world were particularly harsh on this point, calling it derivative to the point of parody. Too many films like this had been released too quickly, and they had hit a point of burnout. Some differences appear when we compare One Missed Call to Ring and its progeny. The virus in this case is something like a possession accompanied with premonition. The haunted voicemails point those affected toward their doom, using their own words rather than a declarative statement that they have seven days. This might seem like a minor difference, but several other stylistic changes bring One Missed Call into its own. This film is noticeably gorier than many other J-horror films. But why wouldn't it be? It's trademark Miike, to be honest. In the opening of the film, a severed arm flies by the camera, separated from its owner, yet with its hand still dialing a phone so it can send its voicemail back in time. This type of cartoonish violence populates the film, giving it a unique baseline compared with Ring. What's more, One Missed Call possesses more social settings than the Ring series. It takes place in cafes, in schools, and during the daytime. Here, the horror isn't that Mimiko might be following our characters throughout the entire proceedings. We know when they'll die and what it will sound like, meaning that the intervening days are spent in existential dread, with our characters being dead people walking. This makes the social daytime elements of the film stark, where we see one dead person walking amongst and interacting with tons of the living. By contrast, nighttime events and settings are presented as lonely and desolate. We get the sense here that our characters are truly lost in the dark. They find themselves lost in the city they should know well. This style of presentation gives us a stark contrast between the two settings, offering a surprising depth to the horror on an atmospheric level. Beyond these stylistic choices, One Missed Call explores the phenomenon of cyclical abuse using the paranormal as a metaphor. We're shown direct parallels between two pairs of characters, Mimiko and her mother, and Yumi and her mother. Yumi initially feels a sense of empathy for Mimiko, assuming that her mother was truly abusive to her. Once the truth about Mimiko and Nanako is revealed to Yumi, Yumi assumes the role of Mimiko, turning Detective Yamashita into her Nanako. Though their origins turn out to be different from one another, Yumi's projection onto Mimiko warps Yumi's worldview and gives her an outlet for her repressed childhood rage, thus perpetuating the cycle of Mimiko's violence. The film shows that these cycles of abuse are spread and perpetuated through networks and technology. The voicemails provide a record of one's own future death, and offer expressions of trauma for posterity's sake. Modern tech like cell phones is described as helping us become more interconnected for better and for worse. This means that this abuse can be both better exposed, but it also offers new avenues for abuse to continue, as the film's ending would indicate. Mimiko is assumed to only know how to communicate her pain through phone calls, and that she wanted to be found. We are led to believe that her lashing out is a form of begging for attention as much as it is an expression of her penchant for violence. In reality, the voicemail provides a piece of technology that allows Mimiko to continue putting her violence and abuse on others. In other words, she wanted to be found so that she could hurt others better. This doesn't end with modern networked technology either. Namely, we see how the camcorder recording of Mimiko attacking Nanako as a child is facilitated by this technology. Through this record, we learn the truth about Mimiko's past, removing all ambiguity that Yumi and the audience may have seen in her tragic backstory. In other words, this recording is an echo of trauma. It's not the actual event, but its existence both offers an objective record and a means of inspiring further pain. 
In the same way, Nanako's stuffed animal, Mr. Bear, plays a similar role, though not in as direct a manner. His music box plays the same song as the ringtone one hears when receiving a warning about their impending doom. This signifies once more how technology details these cycles of abuse, offering a motif to connect Nanako's trauma with that about to be visited upon new victims of Mimiko's wrath. Beyond these observations on the film's theme and style, there's one last notable element to discuss before we move on to the second film in the trilogy, that being the legacy of One Missed Call. The whole trilogy was initially mostly overlooked, with each entry picked up by Media Blasters for their Tokyo Shock label in 2005, 6, and 9. For the most part, the original trilogy was mainly known among those already invested in J-horror, until 2020, when Arrow Video re-released the series with a boatload of extras on Blu-ray. Rather than being truly lambasted for being subpar or outright bad, One Missed Call was simply ignored up to that point. The franchise made more of an impact in America when it was brought over in the death throes of the American remake craze in 2008. Though this take on the film rendered the original film unnecessary in the eyes of most Americans, as was typically the case with these remakes, it also followed the trend set with most of these remakes beyond the American versions of Ring and Juon. By this we mean to say that while One Missed Call 2008 was more impactful in America than One Missed Call 2003, the remake was largely dismissed. According to Rotten Tomatoes, this went on to become the second worst rated film of the decade in the 2000s, with a 0% aggregate approval rating. How can it have a 0% and still be number two? Well, that's because One Missed Call rang in with a mere 80 reviews. 2002's Ballistic X vs. Sever, on the other hand, received a whopping 118 negative reviews and a 0% aggregate score. We wish we could give One Missed Call the win on at least being the most disliked film of the decade by American critics, but unfortunately it seems like it couldn't even reach that far. That all being said, the original One Missed Call is well worth a watch for a number of different groups. J-horror fans who may have missed it due to its later release, Miike fans who wrote it off as one of his unfortunately more mainstream efforts, those charting the history and movements within Japanese horror, or those interested in what American studios mined out of Japan for their own profit in the 2000s. Be sure to let us know in the comments below what your thoughts are on One Missed Call, and check back next time when we'll be discussing its follow-up, One Missed Call 2.